Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon at our first Bright Blue Party Conference event here in Birmingham. Um, I was in York at half past nine trying to get a train and then it was delayed for an hour and a quarter, but it managed to miss out Leeds and Wakefield and get here because it knew that I had to be here at Party Conference. So I am here ten minutes before the start of this event. Um, uh, and this event, the title is called The Dirty Money Laundry, Stopping Economic Crime to Uphold UK Security and Values. Uh, and we're doing it in partnership with the UK Anti-Corruption Coalition. So we're grateful uh, for them for the partnership. Uh, for those of you who don't know Bright Blue, you've got a goodie bag on your chair uh, with lots of information about our full programme uh, for this week in Birmingham, as well as some reading material. Um, so please do that, take that away with you. We're an independent think tank for liberal conservatism. We see our mission as defending and improving liberal society. And we work uh, across four main research areas, which is uh, environment policy, social policy, employment policy, and education policy. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtags, hashtag bright blue and hashtag CPC22. You can also, if you want, mention at we are bright blue, that's ours, and at UK uh, AC Coalition, uh, which is the Twitter handle for our partner. Uh, for those of you watching from where, wherever you might be, a beach or wherever, uh, hello, um, and you are watching, and you can w uh, ask questions through the live stream, uh, and those questions will then be fielded to me <coughs> onto my phone, and I will ask those questions, as well as questions from the floor as well. So please do tell us uh, who you are and where you're from when you are asking those questions. So... Um, the debate today really is around dirty money. So what counts as dirty money? Uh, and what are the sort of implications economically, reputationally, environmentally and socially for the UK? And, ob and obviously we know uh, about Russian belligerence uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and for a long time, very wealthy Russians uh, have also uh, been investing uh, in the UK. But it's not just Russia, it's other countries uh, which have poor human rights records. Uh, where certain leaders uh, are uh, using the UK and investing in the UK. So what can government public policy do about it? Um, the government has committed to table a new piece of legislation to reform Companies House on top of the Economic Crime Act, which was passed earlier this year, and are looking to table legislation called the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. So what more can the government be doing? Will this legislation be enough? And what's the role that the UK can play with other international partners to really uh, tackle this very profound problem? We've got a great set of speakers uh, with uh, us today. So we have John Penrose, MP, to my near left, uh, who was the UK's anti-corruption champion from 2017 to 2022. He's also the Conservative MP for Western Supermare. Susan Hawley, to my near right, who's the Executive Director at Spotlight on Corruption. Tom Keating, uh, on my far left, who's the director for the Centre for Financial uh, Crime and Security Studies at RUSI. And then on my far right, I have Bob Wigley, who's the chair of UK Finance <coughs> and previously chaired the Green Investment Bank Commission. Each of the speakers will have five minutes uh, and then we'll open it up to contributions and questions from you. So, John, over to you first. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I stand up? Just, Go for it. Just to make sure I can see everybody at the back. Um, so, look, but firstly, um, thank you to both Bright Blue and to the Anti-Corruption Coalition for organising this event, because it is a tremendously important issue, and it's one that often gets overlooked in the hurly-burly of the rest of the political debate. And actually, I find it rather refreshing and freeing, the fact that uh, given all the commentary that's going on about mini-budgets and stuff outside this room, I can probably say whatever I like and no one's going to notice. So, <laughs> if I, uh, but... It is an important issue, and it matters because there are huge reputational risks for a country like the UK. We are, after all, host to one of the two largest wholesale money markets on the planet, the other one being New York. Others are, uh, other other uh, forums are available, of course, but we, ha we have one of the biggest on the planet, and that makes us both somewhere which has to be more responsible and have higher standards than everybody else, um, but also it makes us a natural target for all the dirty money which Ryan was talking about. And it isn't just kleptocrats and Russian oligarchs and people like that, although there are plenty of them and plenty of them try and ship money into the UK. 
I mean, it's also crime lords, it's drug runners, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's arms dealers and so forth. All of them are looking for somewhere to put dirty cash. Um, and if they possibly can, given the size of the sums involved, they can afford the very best lawyers, the very best accountants. Um, and if there's an, even the smallest chink in any country's armour, um, then they will exploit it. So it's a really serious issue because all of us, particularly in the Conservative Party, all of us care about the UK being a really attractive place for foreign direct investment. It's vital for our economy, it's vital for our self-respect as much as anything else. Um, and without that reputation, um, then you pretty soon start slipping down various rankings and people start looking as askance when you say, well, why don't you go invest in this country? They go, yeah, I'm not sure it's, not sure it's honest. And there is a far greater amount of clean money on the planet than there is dirty. So if you've got to choose between the two, it's a no-brainer. You go for the clean money every single time. That's what Britain has done throughout its history, and we don't want to stop doing it now. So the problem with where we are at the moment is it kind of depends on if you're a, a glass half full or a glass half empty sort of person. If you're a glass half full person, what you do is you say, look, Britain has been in the forefront of all this stuff for several years. We were one of the first major economies, if not the major economy, so we'll put me right in a minute if I've got this wrong, to go for what's called beneficial ownership transparency, which means that if someone buys um, an asset in the UK, I can go and uh, owns a company in the UK, for example, I can find out who they are and I can find out someone with a pulse and know that it's someone who's a genuine human being with a name and then I can check and see whether or not they are a dodgy person with dodgy money or whether or not they're entirely um, kosher and okay. We were one of the first countries in the world to do that but because as I mentioned we play host to the city of London um, we may have been the first but we left some holes and other people have found those holes and we've been overtaken by some other countries and so there is an enormous amount of more that still has to be done. And the, the glass half empty person in the room would say, yeah, that, that's all very well, but just look at the enormous loopholes which are still here in the UK, which are being exploited every single day of the week, which still allow um, dirty money to come in. And they'll say, look, it's fine, it's lovely that you've all put the, um, the, put the first economic crime act now, happened a couple of months ago, in place. Absolutely essential. It was vital because when it first got introduced, the Russian tanks were massing on the borders of Ukraine. They hadn't quite gone into Ukraine when it was first being introduced. Um, and everybody knew that there were an enormous amount of Russian oligarchs wanting to stash more money and get it out of um, Russia when they could. And that piece of legislation earlier on this year, ladies and gentlemen, was a vital piece of help. <coughs> it plugged a whole bunch of loopholes, um, but it still isn't enough. And we've actually got another Economic Crime Act or bill coming up very, very shortly. In fact, I'm expecting to speak in, uh, in, in the debate, I think it's this Thursday or next Thursday, very soon in the next 10 days, um, which will plug even more of those loopholes. And at that point, we will be, well, we'll be an awful lot better place than we were at the start of the year, or than we were two or three years ago. But the point I would just make before I overrun my five minutes and Ryan... Uh, that cuts me off, but just as a scene setter for this really important debate is if your name is Big Mo and you have a vast lake of dirty cash that you have acquired through you know, whichever, whichever dodgy enterprises you are involved in, you can afford, as I said before, the best lawyers. You can afford the best accountants and if there are any, any tiniest chinks in this nation's armour, Big Mo and his cohorts or her cohorts will exploit it. And so this is an arms race. We will have caught up a lot in, in the course of this year when we pass this second act shortly. And that is absolutely to the good. But because we have the City of London, we are right at the sharp end of that arms race. We are a natural target and we have to keep moving because sure as eggs is eggs, the thing about the... Uh, the kleptocrats, the thing about the drug lords, the thing about the arms dealers is they are criminal entrepreneurs, they think fast, they move fast, and every time we catch up, they will try and leapfrog ahead. So it ain't enough just to catch up. We've got to get ahead of them, and with, this is essential. It's an ongoing thing. We will never be able to win, but we can at least make it that we are a really, really dangerous place for these people to put their money, and at that point, just maybe they'll think of putting it somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, John.
Just to say, if you do want to come and sit down, if you're standing at the back, please feel free. Now is your chance. Please don't be shy and uh, come down and take one of the seats. Um, uh, and just to say, if I could ask the other speakers to remain seated, actually, it's just better for our live stream. Sorry. But John, <laughs> Sorry. still good that you stood up. Um, so, John, very passionate and eloquent, uh, as usual. A question for me is, which country has been very good at this in terms of the legislation and regulation in place to really sort of mitigate the kind of dirty money flows? Who should we be learning from? Who's the sort of gold standard? Oh, this is a question which I, I'd be really interested in what other people on the panel think too. Um, but I, I don't think anywhere is perfect. We're all sort of you know, one-eyed men in the land of the blind, as it were. Um, actually, funny enough, one of the countries which has done some amazing stuff is Ukraine. Um, they've done some really good things on, uh, on uh, public uh, purchasing and procurement. And because they were so fed up with having a bunch of kleptocrats stealing everybody blind, that they basically said, we don't trust anybody who's in government at all, and we're going to make it monumentally uh, uh, transparent so we can see where all the money goes. Um, and as a result, they've kind of established, at least in that area, a bit of a, of a gold standard. But you know, other, I, I, I don't want to sort of decry what other countries are doing too. Perhaps other members of the panel can yeah, 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 yeah. add, add some others as well. So I, I'd agree. There is, there is, you can't look at one country and say, right, we want to do what they're doing. Mm. So, for example, you know, people might think, oh, the United States, hopeless at supervision yeah. of lawyers, for example. Uh, no beneficial ownership transparency, yeah. but pretty good at enforcement, right? Um, there are some countries that you might not expect to hear on the list. So Italy, for example, 70,000 Guarda di Finanza individuals who are out there looking to investigate and prosecute uh, financial and, and tax crime. Countries like Latvia that have been through the ringer, right, have had to really yeah. uh, change the way that they operate. So I think one can best practice shop around the world. We, of course, want people to best practice shop on these issues in the UK. Mm -hmm. And as John rightly says, you know, having perhaps hit a high watermark in 2016-ish, um, like various other things recently, we've plummeted uh, quite dramatically. So that would be my, um, that Great. should be our ambition. People should want to come to the UK to find best practice. Great. We do like policy tourism at Bright Blue, so that's very <laughs> good uh, that you've given us that. Susan, over to you. Yes, great. Thank you very much. And lovely to see so many people here. Um, just to put a bit of uh, flesh on some of what John was saying, um, the IMF recently pointed out just quite how high risk uh, the UK is in its financial assessment uh, of us. And it found that uh, the UK actually attracts some of the most high risk inward flows of investment globally of any jurisdiction. Uh, and while being outside of Europe brings opportunities, it also brings risks. And it found that some of those flows, for, for instance, from some of the highest risk jurisdictions like China, Pakistan, UAE, have actually doubled in the last six years. And that uh, financial transactions with o offshore jurisdictions have gone up by a quarter. Uh, so that is the situation that we're in, that, that, that John was mentioning it. And, and I think it's worth revisiting or remembering what the Intelligence and Security Committee said about why, just why the UK was so attractive for the Russian laundromat, uh, because there were a series of things. One of them was the golden visa regime that the UK had and investor schemes to attract people in uh, through immigration. There was what they called the low uh, or light touch regulation uh, there was the host of professional uh, services, particularly those prepared to launder reputations for kleptocrats and uh, Russian oligarchs. And there was a low enforcement environment with under-resourced uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, so that's the kind of picture that we're in. And, uh, and as Don said, we are a financial centre. These risks aren't going to go away. So it's uh, what we do about it. Uh, and I think then there's a question of like why we should do about it. I and mean, John's made a really compelling case about um, the reputational aspects, uh, getting clean money into the UK. Obviously, Russia has exposed enormous national security risks of not doing something about it. But there are also some really strong economic arguments. So the costs are huge um, of this dirty money problem. <coughs> Uh, Transparency International analysed 400 corruption cases linked to the UK involving 582 different British firms and individuals which cost £325 billion of economic harm globally. Uh, the latest estimates from Portsmouth University about the cost of economic crime to the UK, £350 billion uh, a year 
is the cost to the UK. That's equivalent to 17.5% of our GDP. So it's a huge cost that we have to tackle. Uh, so it's not really whether we can afford to do something about it. It's actually about whether we can afford not to do something about it. And I think the recent Home Office uh, impact assessment for the new Economic Crime and Transparency Bill is really illustrative in this regard because it uh, suggests that by taking measures, the UK could actually save about a billion pounds over the next 10 years as a kind of average and possibly up to 4 billion. So there's really, really strong um, economic arguments for doing this. And then there's what we do about it. So uh, just promised you, Heather, that I'd wave the, <laughs> the manifesto of the APPGs on anti-corruption and uh, fair business banking, which it really is, if anyone hasn't seen it, it is really like a really strong blueprint uh, from a bunch of cross-party parliamentarians about how we tackle uh, this issue. And it's, you know, it's, it's all there and it's, uh, it's really good. Uh, I think um, what we also need to think about is all those things that the Russia report highlighted. You know, how do we learn the lessons from the golden visa uh, regime? It's closed now, but our new uh, visa routes being used instead? Until we've had that report published by the government about what really went wrong with the golden visa regime, we won't really know how we're gonna plug those gaps. So that's really important. We've got to get on top of the professional enablers. Uh, and that means that it's something that's not in the Economic Crime and Transparency Act uh, bill, sorry, <laughs> to be. <laughs> uh, it, we've got to have stronger and more robust anti-money laundering supervision of the professional services in the UK. At the moment, the fines are too weak. There's far too much self-regulation of the professional services going on. And we really need a beefed up um, supervisor of supervisors to really highlight when supervisors are not getting it right. Mm. Uh, we also need stronger corporate liability laws to really encourage the large actors, you know, the, the tech companies, uh, you know, the big law firms, to get their preventative measures in place. Strong criminal laws make companies get good corporate governance in place. And finally, we've got to find a way to reinvest more money in our enforcement bodies. They actually make really good rates of return, but they're massively outgunned, massively under-resourced. So we need to have ring fence budgets uh, for the policing of economic crime in this country, and we need to find a way to get more money. I mean, basic IT, you know, the, the, the police intelligence database, uh, is so, it's, it's, it's 50 years old. I mean, it's just disastrous. Whereas the private sector, you know, has AI, it's like, you know, technologically steaming ahead. So there are things that can be done, uh, um, and it is a bit like whack-a-mole, <laughs> as John said, uh, but, you know, these are really good starts in the Economic Crime Bill and the Economic Crime Transparency Act, and we just need the political will to keep going. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Um, very detailed and forensic there. Um, I, I like your typology of kind of the reasons the UK are quite vulnerable. So the golden visa scheme, the light touch regulation, professional services, the enablers, and then a low enforcement environment. Those four key reasons. W what do you think the government or the UK generally has made most progress on in terms of those four in recent years? And which is the one which is actually we haven't, we need to do much more on that one? Um, well, actually, we've made progress on the golden visa regime by it yeah. being closed down. That was a really big, you know, recognition that this was uh, problematic. Um, I think we learned quite a lot of lessons <coughs> around regulation, but I'm worried that they might be in the process of being unlearned. Um, and we have to really think through what that's going to look like. You know, what is smart regulation that is going to... Uh, tackle this problem. We would like to see economic crime impact assessments being done about regulatory reform to make sure we don't forget these lessons. Um, and I think uh, the, un the, the enforcement picture uh, is, you know, there have been pots of money here and there that have gone into it. We've seen 10 million to a new countering kleptocracy unit at the NCA, but it just isn't a substitute for long-term investment in law enforcement and that's what we need so we've had bits of progress mm. 
then some really big, the golden visa thing was huge, I think. <laughs> that was a really, really welcome. Uh, and actually some of the stuff that John, uh, which I haven't mentioned, is like the beneficial ownership stuff, the company's house reform. This is big, this is really long awaited stuff and, uh, and it's at, that's one of the key vulnerabilities in the UK was com our company's house and how easy it was for, uh, and we saw it with COVID loans as well, you know, organised criminals just setting up companies and just ripping off the UK taxpayer. So it, it's a, that is a really, really major mm. progress. Very interesting, particularly your idea around the sort of economic crime impact assessment of relevant regulatory reforms. That's quite interesting. Great. Uh, Bob, over to you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to join today's panel. And I'm sure <coughs> that everybody in this room shares the objective of stamping out uh, economic crime in the UK. Just, just to make one, I think, sort of more positive point about the UK in this context. I mean, we are, um, depending on which week you look at, the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, maybe next week the seventh. Um, and we are, you know, uh, depending on which product you look at, in the uh, top two global financial centres in the world. So we shouldn't be too... St and it's a great place to live, contrary to what the BBC might have you believe. So, so we shouldn't be too surprised that we see a lot of dirty money in this country. There are some great things about the UK that attract people and therefore the money that comes with them here. That is not to say we don't have a problem that we need to deal with, and I'm going to come on to that in detail. Um, and I want to include fraud as well as, as well as money laundering because these two things, tend, as uh, John uh, has you know, pioneered over the years, um, tend to go hand in hand. And fraud is a particularly horrible crime because it, although the individual amounts might be quite small, um, they are someone's savings or someone's deposit for a house or someone's retirement money uh, and they ruin lives. So we really need to get to the bottom of um, stopping fraud in the UK and of course it's usually money that's finding its way into funding other sorts of crime as John said. So ultimately uh, it's a threat to our financial system and to our national security. Now, contrary to what some personal finance programmes would have you believe, um, which is that the banking industry does nothing to uh, try and stop fraud, we are very actively engaged on this front. And indeed, um, John will know the stats better than I, but I think 40% of reported crime in the UK is now fraud, about 2% of police spending is on fraud, um, and probably only two of the nation's 42 police forces have any serious uh, anti-fraud capability. They're both in London. So I would say that the banking system uh, is actually the nation's fraud police force. Um, that's my saying, but I believe it. Um, so um, we stop, we think about two thirds of all fraud in the UK, that leaves a third, that's obviously too much. Um, banks spend billions of pounds a year uh, on advanced security systems to try and pick up, detect and stop fraud. Uh, we submit about 92%, I think at the last count, of all the suspicious activity reports that go into the National Crime Agency. That's about 4 million triggers in our systems that lead to around 400,000 submissions every year. That's in stark contrast to you know, legal accounting and other professions, which would be under 1% each. So that's where I think we need to be looking more aggressively. Um, we have a unit uh, in our office called the DCPCU, which targets organised criminal groups, particularly around credit cards, which... Um, so we go out every day, we, we pull what we know in, in banks, financial intelligence officers, what the agencies know. Every day we go out and bust organised crime gangs, we seize computers and mobile phones, we retrieve um, stolen credit cards, and that often leads to information on a wide variety of crime types. We also have our Take 5 to Stop Fraud campaign, which I hope you've seen on your bank statements. Uh, you will see them at ATMs, uh, you'll see them every time you go into your banking app, you'll see them on bus stops. Uh, uh, and basically this is all about saying if someone's after your data, someone asks you a question about can you please give me your PIN or your banking, just stop for five seconds and think is this a person I should be sharing this information with and if in doubt, don't do it. Very successful um, campaign. But we cannot do this on our own. Uh, we need more help uh, in terms of better public-private partnerships. I'm going to come on to that. And we need particularly, we need more help from uh, the telcos and the big techs. Um, so <clears throat> what have we been doing to um, turn our objective of making the UK the safest and most transparent place to conduct financial services business in the world into reality. A few years back, we worked closely with the government to create what was then the world's first uh, world-leading uh, economic, economic crime threat assessment. So that pulls everything the agencies know with everything that we as banks know about where money is coming from and going to and put together the worst, as it were, prioritised threat list. From that, we work with the same group of people to create uh, the first, the world's first ever economic crime plan. I sit with the uh, Home Secretary and the Chancellor 
on something called the Economic Crime Strategic Board that has the responsibility for uh, progressing these, these, these pieces of work and then pushing it down to detailed implementation plans to attack the biggest threats in order uh, with um, data and intelligence. So working very closely uh, with government. Now, new legislation, as John uh, rightly identified, is a really important uh, thing that we need and has come from all this detailed work on where are the biggest threats. I'd like to pick out four in particular important developments, all of which are current. Um, the first is that we've had lots of new entrants to the payment system. So you have banks that do payments, and they're very heavily regulated, but you have lots of new entrants who, for various reasons, and I include in that companies like Amazon, who are not similarly regulated. So we have a mantra, which happily the regulators have now adopted, which is same activity, same risk, same regulation. In other words, if you're doing something that looks like it's payments within a bank, you should probably be regulated like the bank. And that's a mantra the regulators are picking up, and that will come through in uh, some of the um, bills coming through this late, later this year and in the work of the Payment Systems Regulator uh, and the FCA. Um, there are particularly important uh, clauses in the Financial Services Markets Bill around improving the way we tackle APP fraud in the UK. Um, then there is the Online Safety Bill, uh, which we hope will not be delayed, will not be watered down, because it has very important provisions for the first time ever putting responsibility on big tech platforms to stop fraud at source. We think about 90% of fraud that we deal with in the banking system emanates on an online platform. Today, those companies have no responsibility to stop it. Indeed, they make profits from placing adverts which facilitate it. That is unsustainable. We must get the online safety bill um, through Parliament with that clause in it. And then the final one, which will probably really surprise some people, the economic uh, What's the full title? Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill, which John referred to, really important. It has detailed um, uh, intelligence and information sharing powers in it. Now, this might surprise you, but when Bank A uh, transfers some money to Bank B and thinks that the person who's transferring the money might be committing a fraud, under current oh. privacy and other com banking confidentiality legislation, they're not allowed to, as it were, ring up Bank B and say, we think there's a problem with this payment, don't pass it on. You might be surprised to hear that, but that's that's the situation. So we have uh, we have drafted a clause over over many years of research, which is going in that bill, which basically says that if a bank has uh, reasonable grounds to suspect that someone's committing a fraud, they can share information in real time, not just with their fellow banks, but with law enforcement, and work together to try and stop more fraud. You th think that sounds pretty basic, but it's taken five years to get there. We hope it'll be in the bill, and well, it's in the bill. We, we may need to make sure it's in the act. Um, I'll stop very soon, um, but one quick thing I want to say, we can do some things outside legislation. So we've just presented a plan to the government um, called a risk-based approach to payments. We have, as you probably know in this country, one of the uh, fastest uh, and simplest fast payment systems in the world. Unfortunately, the crooks have worked that out. It's another reason the UK is attractive, because you can transfer a lot of money very quickly. And uh, again, people don't realise this, banks aren't allowed to stop those payments. So if we think someone's committing a fraud, we have a potential within the law with certainty to delay the payment by 24 hours, but no longer. So we're seeking powers from government, either through statutory instrument or through uh, you know, ministerial guidance or regulation or law, whatever it takes, to enable us to stop that payment for at least three days, because we think that will give us the time then to, uh, to fully investigate it, work with law enforcement and stop the payment. Uh, so watch out for that. And then finally, I just want to uh, want to make one comment about, um, you know, uh, FOS, the PSR, uh, money box. all these names come to mind. We spend far too much time in this country talking about who should pay the bill when someone is the subject of a fraud. I'd rather stop the fraud in the first place. Um, and so I, I read with interest yesterday's um, publication by the PSR, which has a very interesting sentence in it, which says, that um, stopping fraud should be the responsibility of both the um, receiving and the sending bank, uh, the principle of which I completely agree with, but it would have been more helpful if the sentence had said uh, the people responsible for fraud are, number one, the fraudster. In some cases where a customer has ignored repeated warnings, shared a PIN, or, frankly, after repeated warning made um, misjudgments, it, it must, there, there must be some responsibility on consumers to take responsibility for their own actions. After that there should be responsibility on the sending and receiving bank to try and pick up the fraud, stop it, uh, you know, better warn the consumer. But we kind of got this thing the wrong way around at the moment. Anyway, I'll stop there. I hope that was a useful summary. Yeah, very useful. Thank you, Bob. Um, 
So the point on fraud uh, and all of the campaigns that you're talking about banks doing and the, and the steps that we now need to take, I mean, I think a lot of people in this room would have noticed a, a real shift in that in recent years in terms of, you know, before you make transactions. Um, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that despite all of that, fraud is still increasing, financial fraud is still increasing. So that would be indicative of, despite all the efforts that you're putting in, they're not quite enough, and what more can be done? You're correct, it's growing, and uh, the answer is many of the things that are in the three bills that I've referred to uh, that are coming through this year will give us those, those extra powers that we need, as John said. It's a result of four or five years of detailed work by, by everyone in this, this group, plus lots of other people, and it will give us new powers to share information, to act faster, um, just to be smarter this time than the, than the criminal who's found the loophole through our current system. And what would be the opposition to those new powers that you want? If there are, I mean, I, you, you obviously think they're very reasonable, but put yourself I would, I would, in, a, yes. in a, a different person's shoes. Why would, why would people... Well, how many people in this room really need to transfer £75,000 in 10 seconds, more than about twice in their life, uh, if ever? I mean, maybe a house deposit. Um, I can't think of another reason, you know, for, as it were, quotes, normal people to need to do that. And would it really be, you know, a breach of your civil liberties if we delayed it three days rather than a day? Don't think so. So I don't think there is a reasonable objection. You will get lots of objections right. from people who are up to no good. It's a bit like the people who don't like people looking at their emails or their telephone conversations. They, you know, if you have nothing to hide, why are you bothered? But that's just okay, a personal so opinion. Okay. Uh, I think that's a bit more controversial. But, Indeed. Um, <laughs> you said make it controversial, so I'm trying to be helpful. But okay, so the civil, the civil liberties arguments, whether they're plausible or not, that's, that's where they are. Right, great. Thank you. Uh, and over to you, Tom. Excellent. Well, what else is there to, uh, to say? I was trying to guess what everyone would say, and so far um, uh, I've been roughly uh, right. So I think the way I categorise what, what John has said is, like, if you're the organised crime baron or the corrupt dude and you're driving along in your car, you can maybe see the headlights of the pursuing kind of UK legislation now, having not been able to see it for, for some time. So we're, we're definitely catching up. But I think an important point is that we cannot rest. One of the problems, as I mentioned earlier on, is we reached a high watermark and then, yes, we had the Criminal Finances Act 2017, but essentially we haven't sort of kept our foot um, on, the, on, on the gas d d despite the efforts of civil servants and, and others. Um, Sue talked about the things we need to fix domestically. The way I like to think about it is if you go to Financial Services R Us, at the very far end there is like a rather gloomy aisle with a flickering light. You walk down there, you can get all the stuff that you need to be a money launderer, and unfortunately, on the boxes on the shelves, it says Britain is great for money laundering, right? So the UK has a, has a fantastic empire of tools that can be used by money launderers. But I want us to stop there for a second, because those tools can also be used in, an, in a, uh, in a, in a forward-leaning way, right? If you sit at the centre of financial services in the way that we do in the UK, the access that you have to information, the access you have to money flows, with all the concerns that... Bob raised about the inability for the private sector to share information, which remains something that we need to keep focusing on. You should be able to use that information um, as, a, as a tool for fighting the fight. One of the things that this country is very good at uh, is the whole area of, of intelligence. And so this is what I want to talk about just for a second, which is, are we really using the information that we have in this country as effectively as we can to combat, and I'm not talking about the low-level guys passing cash in a, in a car park, I'm thinking about the nodes that are directing fraud attacks against the UK, the, the, the enablers that Sue and others have, have mentioned who are consistently facilitating uh, money laundering. What are we actually doing to create the picture of who are the bad guys uh, and then, and then uh, acting on that? And this matters. This matters more and more uh, because whilst we normally think about illicit finance and money laundering as a criminal issue and something that the police and others uh, related to the police should deal with. Let's just stop for a second and think about the news that came out a couple of weeks ago where it was revealed uh, in a declassified, I think, uh, telegram or whatever it was from the US State Department that the Kremlin had spent $300 million trying to undermine elections in uh, up to 24 countries around the world. That's not something that the police are going to identify. That's something that the security services, that the intelligence-led parts of our country um, are meant to be uh, looking at and trying to uh, trying to identify. So I think it's really important 
that we, of course, focus on the criminal side of all of this, but we understand that this is also a matter of national security that we should care about. Illicit finance is a vector for hostile state activity. It's a vector for the state threats that things like the integrated review uh, raised the alarm on um, 18 months um, or, or so ago. So that the weaponization of finance to buy influence, to undermine our open societies, it's great that we live in an open society, but we need to be conscious of what that exposes us to. I was sitting at a dinner in a uh, Oxbridge college, I'll try and be as vague about it as possible, um, back in March, and I was sitting next to uh, a lady who turned out was in charge of governance for donations at this Oxbridge College. And we got into a conversation and she said, you cannot believe how busy I have been since the 24th of February going through all the lists of donors that we've had over uh, recent years and praying, her word, not mine, praying that I didn't come across one that in hindsight we uh, regretted. So I think we need to, uh, of course, focus um, on the, the criminal response to this. We need to think about you know, what is the Home Office doing, uh, what is the NCA doing, uh, what are the supervisors doing, what's the private sector doing, but we also need, I think, to view this as a, a national security issue. And with that, of course, comes, as we all know, funding. And to pick up on something that Sue said, the way we respond to economic crime in illicit finance in this country is piecemeal. It's fragmented. It really is. And you know, I don't think we would argue at Rusi that you need one like jumbo, you know, economic crime uh, police uh, f fighting force. But let's look at the way counterterrorism operates in this country, right? Huge investment in counterterrorism, regional um, expertise uh, and, uh, and coordination. And I think until we treat uh, illicit finance as a national security threat, we are going to continue to shuffle the deck chairs. The organized criminals, the kleptocrats and others that want to do us harm We'll see our headlights maybe somewhere behind us um, in the rearview mirror uh, as they're driving along, but we're never going to catch up with them uh, and get ahead, ahead of them and actually stop what we're doing. And I, but I want to end on one optimistic point, um, which is this. I've had the opportunity to give evidence uh, four or five times to the Foreign Affairs Committee over the last few years. And across the table from me has been an individual who I think understands uh, how to stop illicit finance in this country, what needs to be done. That person, Tom Tugendhat MP, is now responsible for dealing with this issue. So I have every confidence that Tom uh, will now walk the walk in his role as a security minister. But I do think that those of us that care about this issue need to make sure that he doesn't forget that responsibility. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And Tom Tugendhat is actually our key speaker tonight at our drink tank, so thank you for lining that up. Stay for I'm going to be there. Yeah. So please, everybody's welcome to come to that. It's, um, it's at 8.30 tonight. I, I can tell you I met with, him, met with him last week. We had a detailed conversation about all the things I touched on in my address, and uh, he professes uh, support for nearly all of them, and we intend to work closely with him to try and deliver some of them. Great. Okay, so a vote of confidence there uh, in Tom. Uh, so, Tom, uh, the question I had for you was actually around universities um, and just how bad it is uh, U UK universities taking donations from very suspect sources. Um, I, I don't know if you could sort of give a, you know, a bit more of an overview of that. Yeah, I mean, not I, I, necessarily naming yeah, particular no, institutions. Look, I, 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 I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, so I, so I won't. I just think that the, the question in my mind is that any organization which takes money from a third party needs to not only ask itself, is the money legit? Where did it come from? You know, do I want to be associated with the person who's donating it? But also, and this is a question that's really hard to answer, what is the purpose of that donation? Right? So I, you know, like you, right, I work for a charity. And if somebody approaches us with a check for 150 grand, I'm pretty suspect. Why do you want to give us that? I'd love to take the money off you, but I really want to understand. And I freely admit, I've got myself into one position last year where somebody offered us money. I thought, that's great. Let's go down. No, let's not go down this road, actually, because it's starting to appear, feel really uncomfortable. So I think that we should not only care about where the money's come from, who's giving it to us, but also why. And our system is not set up to think, why is money being transferred? It's more set up to think, where did it come from? And so that kind of change in thinking is what we need to do. And that applies to universities, it applies to culture institutions, it applies to political parties, it applies to think tanks. Um, why is that money being given to me? And what is that or, the individual or that organisation expecting to get into return? Uh, for uh, get, in, get in return? Because they're not expecting to get nothing. 
Very interesting. Okay, let's open it up to questions and contributions from the floor. Just to say, um, although it's a small room, so everyone will hear you, we do need uh, you to ask your question through a microphone, which will be coming round, but we need to do that so people can hear you on the live stream. So if you could wait for the microphone to come, that would be great. Just a reminder uh, for everyone in the room and also watching um, live from wherever you are, please do tweet uh, using the hashtag brightblue and CPC22 and do ask questions uh, and I will field them from here. So, uh, on the floor, questions please. Uh, so we'll start with this gentleman right at the back here. If you could tell us your name and where you're from, that would be very helpful. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, James Tunbridge, a, a party member, although in this instance I'm interested in a question I'm going to pose because I'm a board member for the City of London Police that run Action Fraud and that wasn't mentioned, although it was a pretty obvious mention that there were only two forces, they're both in London, so it's the Met and the City. But the City is trying to run action fraud nationwide on behalf of forces. I'd be very interested in the views on whether that's working. I mean, we are absolutely swamped with the number of inquiries, and it's a challenge because other police forces aren't as interested in fraud as I think they should be. Um, yes, yeah, I'm com com happy to have a go at it. But first of all, I want to be highly complimentary about the City of London Police, who are the nation's fraud, you know. Uh, center of expertise. Uh, we have a very close working relationship with them, uh, could not be closer, and indeed most of the staff in the DCPCU, which is the unit I referred to, come from the City Line Police. Um, I think your broader point, though, is uh, the, the last sentence, which is that more police forces need to be uh, better resourced to tackle fraud is really the point. As I said, it's really, it's really the Met and the City Line Police today that are that have any kind of significant resource focused on anti-fraud measures, and we do need to see that spread around the country. So one of the things we're looking to do, for example, is potentially place um, a, a new DCPCU centre uh, in the north, uh, so that we, we, as it were, spread the love uh, to some, some a wider group of police forces and engage police in, in wider forces in what we're doing. Great. Uh, more questions and contributions. Um, so um, let's take this gentleman here. And again, if you could say who you are and um, where you're from, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Daniel Bruce, Transparency International. Um, I, uh, I think John's assessment of the glass half full or half empty is a pretty good uh, metaphor for, for where we are at the moment. And, and we've had tremendous progress on the legislative front for economic crime this year. But we also know from past experience for example, with the introduction of the unexplained wealth order, which is a really important tool, that having the legislative tool there alone isn't always enough. Um, and for those tools to work, they need resources behind them. And for there to be resources behind them, it needs political will. We also know that the Economic Crime Act Part 1 earlier this year didn't have political will, and it was out in the long grass uh, until the tanks rolled into Ukraine on the 24th of February, and it took that situation to create that political will. So... John, I think particularly interested to hear your reflections and those of others on how we sustain that will going forward. I think Sue's made some very powerful arguments on the economic arguments, but are, are they being heard by our parliamentarians? John, um, over to you. I, I devoutly hope so. They certainly were, I think, but you know, we, we've, had, we've got a new Prime Minister and a, and a new uh, government, set of government ministers, so we'll have to make sure um, that it continues to be done. And I'd echo Tom's point about Tom Tugendhat being a, a good appointment as the new security minister, so we're starting from a good place there. Um, but I think that Bob and Sue are both right to say, you know, we are horribly under-enforced in this country. I mean, it, I forget which of us it was who said you know, uh, something like 2% of our law enforcement um, resources are put towards combating fraud, and it's 40% and rising of all crime. crime. Now, clearly, that is not, that's not a sustainable position. Um, and actually, what and I think actually, as a political movement, we here in the Conservative Party need to need to. This means we've got to change what we say and what we do, because all of us here and successive Tory conferences for decades, and we've all got up here and we've banged the table. We say we need more bobbies on the beat, and we do, but we need more bobbies behind screens. Yeah, we need we need people who are um, accountants who are who are police uh, enforcers too. Um, and that's, that's not the traditional view in this political party or in many others. Um, and it's much less sexy and people don't make you know, crime dramas about it to anything like the same degree. Um, but it is absolutely essential. And unless we do that, it's not just fraud. It's all other kinds of financial crime as well. 
completely agree. And can, I, can I just make one really practical suggestion? Is we, sh we should stop calling it fraud. Because to, when you go out to the street and you say fraud, people think of people dressed like me in big companies doing really sophisticated stuff. Actually, what this is is really grubby, low-level online theft, most mm. of it, right? Oh. It's just people nicking your money through the internet. Yeah. Sorry to, to use no. the vernacular, yeah. but I mean, that's what it is. So we've got to get away from fraud and start talking about online theft or online burglary. Apparently, you can't do that in Scotland because it has, uh, has unfortunate connotations. But uh, that's what we need to do. We need to change the terminology so that people understand what we mean. Susan? Yeah, I mean, just to pick up also on the, the last question from the uh, gentleman from the City of London, please. I mean, actually, if you look at the stats, fraud has actually gone up by 99%, and charges for fraud have gone down by 77% over the last decade. So we really are in quite a cri <coughs> actual crisis of enforcement, uh, and the little bit of tinkering here and there and a few million here and there is not going to touch the sides, basically. So we have to think big, what are the ambitious solutions? Actually, it shouldn't be on the private sector alone. Mm -hmm. We need really skilled up yeah. uh, public sector. We need to find ways to actually attract and retain the best talent. This should be like the sexiest job out there to go out and tackle these issues, you know. But um, it, it's, you know, unfortunately, you know, underpay, low morale, it, that's not where we're at. Tom? Yeah, so I, I always wanted to come back to the, the first question as well, which is that, you know, have we actually appreciated that this, is, this isn't just kind of grubby fraud, right? This is like, organ if, I, if I want to make money, then I think fraud, online fraud, is like the best way to go as an organized crime group right now. Um, and so I think we need to view this as much more than some poor person getting their credit card ripped off or some sort of online transaction not, not going through. This, we, need a, we need an organized response to this because it is an organized crime. And this in a way comes to Daniel's point, which is that, you know, who gets fired when the UK um, sort of fails to respond to economic crime in the way it should do? Where does the buck actually stop? Um, and I think part of the problem is we have a very fragmented uh, response. And again, I'm not arguing for like a kind of super you know, economic crime agency, but I do argue for notwithstanding the great work that John did as the anti-corruption champion, some actual commissioner, you know, appointed commissioner like we have for counter-terrorism legislation, like we have for, um, for modern slavery, whose job it is to mark the government's homework, what is happening, and then the government is accountable to that individual. Because at the moment, we get these kind of peaks and troughs of activity, um, and we can't, uh, frankly, sustain ourselves as a global financial centre with credibility uh, if we have peaks and troughs. We need somebody who is constantly holding whoever is in office uh, feet to the fire to ensure that actually uh, we are doing what we should do as a responsible steward of the global financial system. And can I add one very quick last yes. thing? Yeah. And, and funding, <laughs> very, on the economic crime transparency, a really good example of this is, you know, it's a really good piece of legislation, but how are you going to make sure that Companies House actually has the right people who are paid the right money to actually verify all these companies uh, and you know there is a kind of provision a little bit ambivalent uh, in the act uh, the bill for uh, companies has to raise its registration fees and we have like the the most absurdly low fees in the world it's 12 quid <coughs> to set up a company in the US it's between $400 and $1600 depending on which state you do it in 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 Jersey it's 600 pounds Guernsey, it's £100. We really are, like, just an outlier. In but, just, but just on that, we should pay credit to, if you don't know Graham Barrow, you should follow him on LinkedIn or social media, because there is one guy living in West London who has done more to expose the negative way in which Companies House is abused than the entire uh, establishment system. So. Okay, and I can maybe just quickly come in on that too. I mean, I think the, the proposed reforms to Companies House are, uh, are good, but they only take us to first base. And, and for example, um, the checks that will be required of someone for them to open a company in the UK will still fall short of what will be required of you to open a bank account in the UK, for example. Mm. So we are doing more on a daily basis every time someone comes and opens a bank account than companies has, will be doing under the new legislation for somebody who wants to open a company. So that can't be, yeah. can't be good. Right, more questions. So Eric at the back, um, if you uh, wait for the microphone. I'll take a round of three, actually, just to so uh, Thank you. My name is, um, is Eric Pickles. I'm a member of the House of Lords, and I used to do jobs, uh, uh, John's job. But I didn't do it as well as John, but I, I used to do his job. Um, I can't 
agree strongly enough about our question of um, theft online, this the petty stuff, and the need for the police to wake up and understand this is the way crime is going, this is the way people are, are fleecing the public, and they are light years behind in terms of being able to tackle that. But could I come back to money laundering? Now, some of the prosecutions we've seen, uh, and it's a wee while since I was doing Johns, I was briefed about. And what that tells you is it takes such a long time to bring a prosecution. They are very expensive in terms of putting a prosecution together. And low betide the prosecution authorities if they lose a case. Because then they have to explain to ministers why they spent millions of pounds uh, on a prosecution and have not had a degree of success. <coughs> so in a way, I suspect there's a degree of rationing going on in terms of where you can put resources in. And I'm firmly of the view that what you actually need is a more transparent approach to ensuring that the public have a better idea in terms of what uh, individuals are, are doing and more accessible uh, at, uh, to the public in terms of having procedures that you need to go through. So the point about why is this person wanting to give me a quarter of a million pounds? What are they going to get out of it? I think those kind of donations need to be very transparent in their nature. Um, so in many cases people are doing a whole series of this to get a gong or something. Uh, but in some ways they're just trying to shove money off uh, to try and create a public image uh, that is uh, better than the reality that they have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Eric. Let's. I'm going to take two more questions. So um, this gentleman here, and then this gentleman. Hello. Oh, there we are. Hello, Shane Morgan from Derbyshire. Um, so I'm actually a sanctions lawyer for uh, international law firm, and I work within risk day in day out. And there's just two points what Susan was saying. So we don't actually use Companies House because it's got so many errors. We use a system, although there are other systems out of the Orbis that shows us the whole way through. I want to know what the panel thinks of this question. We see issues come through day in, day out. We have firms that I work for, very large, they can afford to pay us, they have this huge risk departments. When a client comes to us and I see this day in, day out, and it's quite interesting, I came here by, um, by Fluke actually, it's, it's a really good discussion. When a client comes to us and it's a major fund and we run the systems and it hits Jersey or Guernsey, we have the systems to check where that goes to and I draft documents and I say, that's not coming in, that's not, that is, that isn't. They then go to high street firms, law firms on the street, who can only afford company's house, it stops here, the director goes, oh, it's a quarter of a million pound property transaction, the fees are about 20%, we'll take it, it'll be fine. And then what's the panel's point in how we can help these the firms that simply can't afford a massive compliance department, they just simply can't afford it, and these things, we're talking about um, the cracks, that's one of the cracks. The second point is, when these firms come to us, although the key is to make sure we're trying to stop this, a lot of clients we see offshore law firms are all competing with each other. If it's too rigorous, the system, clients will simply just go, we've got a bond that needs to go through now, this deal's price sensitive, and they'll go to another firm. How do we manage the anti-money laundering process without also having firms going from we have great law firms here, and then they might go to Guernsey, a law firm over there, because it's taken too long. They have nothing to hide. I know there's a question of nothing to hide. Why wouldn't you do it? But then, if that keeps happening, how do we juggle that that process? Okay, that's that's yeah, very interesting observations, particularly the sort of proportionality around the checks and um, uh, and how uh, different organisations might react to that. Um, and it's, just remind me of your name again, sorry, Shane. Shane. Great. And then let's have this chap here. Thank you. Uh, my name's Peter Crossan. I'm from Greater Manchester. I uh, work for a national bank and my job is to basically train staff on um, implementing our procedures on money laundering and understanding. I think, John, you mentioned about us wanting to get ahead. Uh, th the start for our company is just getting up on par and to know who our customers are, to understand what they're doing. And there's great stuff we're doing around understanding beneficial ownership structures because it's not a case of money launderers coming in, setting up businesses and utilising them. They're utilising the infrastructure that we have, getting involved in businesses. For example, um, you mentioned about charities and people investing in charities. 
it's a way of creeping into the existing system. Now, one of the biggest pushbacks that my delegates get when they go out speaking to customers is, why are you doing this? Why do you want to know so much about me? Why do you want to know so much about our business? And I'm not sure if, the, if many people know, but 52% um, uh, of all financial crime, when you talked about, Bob, fraud before, it's not fraud, it's scams, really. 52% of that, um, uh, the victims are between the ages of 16 to 34. No one recognises that. They think it's the silver surfer mm. generation. Now, there's a big difference between IT literacy and financial literacy, and I think that's where we're feeling at the moment. We need eyes and ears on the ground and people to understand what we're doing, the bigger picture of what financial crime actually is. Now, I'm a big advocate for pushing for financial literacy in schools between the ages of 16 to 18. You know, once a year, at least 48 hours um, uh, uh, per year of financial literacy. What do you think, first of all, of that idea? What are we doing to educate people on financial literacy? And what can we do to educate people uh, further? Because there, there, there are eyes and ears on the ground while we can do the bigger picture stuff. Great. Very excellent, mm. informed uh, contributions. Thank you very much. On the financial literacy point, I mean, I've seen some evidence that, that you know, certainly agree that we need to improve financial literacy. Interventions at school, particularly from an early age, I'm not sure the evidence is particularly what's been done thus far uh, showing efficacy, um, but interest in other people's. Bob, so MAPS, to... which is the money and pension service set up by the government, has the responsibility, sort of, with the FCA to ensure there is financial literacy in the UK. Uh, and they have their own programs. All of the major banks have really quite significant programs, which are entirely voluntary and done in the interest of our consumers. Um, but you're right to say that it's uh, financial literacy in the UK has a long way to go to catch up with what's needed. If you can't, if you leave school and you don't have the basic understanding of, you know, what I would call Mrs. Thatcher's handbag story. So you know, you can only spend from the household uh, account what comes into the household account. One could apply the same to uh, government. I would argue, but uh, uh, then, uh, then you know, you shouldn't be leaving school with that, with that lack of knowledge. It's absolutely fundamental, just as important as reading or writing. So I agree with you. There's a long way to go, but a lot of people are doing a lot of good things on it. But yes, lots to be done. Susan, well, I'm just wondering if it's just about financial literacy and just you know the point that people are so clever. My mum got a text recently saying, "Oh, mum, I just um, my toilet fell down. My phone fell down the toilet. Can you give me a ring?" and none of her children's phone had fallen down the toilet but she was wise enough to think oh I'll, I'll just check but a lot of people that you know they're so clever these scammers aren't they that it's not just about well social engineering yeah. is is uh, predominant in most cases of uh, of scams yeah yeah but i want to come to that point about the um high street versus the big law firm because it isn't i mean i've i've definitely heard in 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 you know, circles where they're talking about how you tackle bribery, for instance, um, that whether there's a kind of duty on the bigger uh, companies in the context of bribery, but maybe it works, the same for money laundering law firms, to kind of uh, mentor, actually, some of these firms and, and show them what good compliance looks like uh, and to offload some of their skills. If you sort of I mean. think with respect, and first of all, I think it's a question for the law society, not any of us, but uh, secondly, it is a question of risk appetite. You work for a big firm which has a low risk appetite, so they spend money on, you know. Although, although I will say they call us the anti-business unit. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. They, I'm, I, I, look, I worked in an investment bank. I understand. I understand the antithesis to compliance when you're a young person trying to make your way in an industry. I understand that. But, but I'm afraid these smaller law firms have a much higher risk appetite. And, I mean, the answer to that is pretty clear. I think they, they, you need more enforcement so that they lower their risk appetite. And basically, they need to up their game. Can I? Maybe, maybe I'll... On that, is the, the, the question I would be interested in is you go to them and say, okay, well, what's, what do you use, right? So you said, okay, they use Companies House. Now, we know Companies House uh, uh, is, is not up to scratch. So that should, that should accelerate our desire to make sure that Companies House works. Like what tools are they actually using? They shouldn't have to fork out 50, 100 grand on Orbis, uh, WorldCheck, you know, Dow Jones, whatever. What systems they're using? Let's make sure they're fit for purpose. Um, and I don't know, has anyone surveyed them to, to actually do that? and then determine, well, what do we as government or do we as the supervisor uh, of the sector need to make sure is working? Because there's no point in having people relying on tools 
uh, that they think provide integrity and actually find that they are garbage. John. Um, yeah, I just wanted to build on that last point to say um, it is clearly up to the law society to have this conversation with you know, middle and smaller size law firms in the same way as UK Finance and others are doing it for, for banking. Um, I think it's also a responsibility, though, on, on politicians and policy makers to say, how can we, in the same way as you know, we will turn around and look at red tape and say, how can we cut the cost of achieving that particular environmental standard? Not cut the standard, but how can we get to it cheaper, more fast, more quickly, more nimbly? And we should be doing the same thing for enforcement in this area and for due diligence in this area. What's the quickest, simplest way of getting you know, uh, mostly confident or confident enough for a small firm that can't afford one of the big um, intelligence systems? Um, and how can we make that really cheap and easy and quick for them so that they can be good enough? Um, and, and that's something which is partly to do with law lawyers and law firms and the law society, but it's also partly to do with policymakers, we should be applying the same disciplines of better regulation that we try to do for other bits of red tape. We should be applying it here too in order to make it just take away the excuse of it's all a bit difficult or it's all a bit slow or it's all a bit expensive. And on the point about um, financial, uh, uh, financial education, um, yes, uh, you're absolutely right about financial education being essential. Um, actually, financial education is part of the PHSE curriculum for all secondary schools. And in fact, some of us think it should be for primary schools, PHSE curriculum as well. It's already there. Um, it isn't done terribly well in all schools. Certainly the financial literacy piece of it isn't. So some schools do it well, some schools don't. And the ones that do it tend to focus on things like trying to understand what a mortgage is and what a good pension is and those sorts of things. They tend not to do an awful lot of stuff about scams and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think we need to raise our game very dramatically on all of those areas. Perhaps this is one of the ones that tends not to get mentioned and should be. I'd like to just pick up on something Lord Pickles said about the police needing to um, wake up on fraud. Um, just in defence of the police, I'm reminded of, um, I don't know, he was a Marmite character, but Ian Blair, when he was uh, Commissioner of the Met, made a very good series of wreath lectures. And one of the points he made was that no one has defined what the police should do for about 60 years. So the police have kind of, and if you think about what's happened over the last 60 years, you know, how the world's changed. Um, so, you know, do you want them to go and fight uh, a burglar when he enters your house, or do you want them to go and deal with an online theft? And, and no one's told them, right, which is more important or are they equally important? And that's why you've ended up, I think, in a situation where 40% of reported crime is fraud in the widest sense and only 2% of police spending. So I think at some point there needs to be a Royal Commission on the purpose of the police, which could then, you know, which could then lead to a change in priority. Is, 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 the, is the burglar in your house more or less important than the online burglar? Good question. I'm not sure that really does the job for someone else. You know, uh, we've got to recognise where crime is going. We've got to recognise where organised crime is going. Um, you know, we, do, we, need to, we need to address better that. It's a terrible compromise. Pun intended. Well, in, in, in a way, I, would, uh, I, I think I would agree with the, the sentiment, which is that... Um, uh, you know, there's this, uh, I can say this because I'm Irish, but there's this joke, right, where if you go up to uh, someone in Dublin and say, how do you get to the station from here? They say, well, I wouldn't start here. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, you kind of wonder if we're actually still kind of fighting the last battle here and haven't stopped to, to is what the Americans would call, kind of improve our situational awareness. Like, where, where should we actually be deploying our resources? We don't have infinite resources. When we started the programme at Rusi in 2014, we started it, uh, kind of in the exhaust of this idea to set up public-private partnerships and that became the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force and to follow how those are going. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, is this going to become outsourcing responsibility to, to the private sector? And with respect, I think we have kind of slipped down, down mm -hmm. that road because we just don't have the resources that we, that we need. We need more resources, but we also need to be smarter about how we deploy the resources uh, we have we have we have got and, and I don't think anyone's really stopped to think about uh, whether that is indeed being achieved great thank you Tom let's have the final round of questions now so again do wait for the microphone and please tell us who you are and uh, the organization you're from this gentleman here Richard Newcomb from Ailes oh sorry Richard Newcomb from Aylesbury I'm a retired chief crown prosecutor <coughs> and in my career of 28 years I prosecuted very few frauds why did I prosecute very few frauds basically because the local police force 
didn't bring them to me. Why didn't they? Because they're too busy dealing with burglars, robbers, and, uh, people committing assault, etc. And the other aspect of it is we have 43 police forces in England and Wales. When somebody rings you up on the telephone to scam you, does he helpfully only ring up from the area covered by your local police force? Does he ring you up, in fact, even from this country, possibly from abroad? Effectively, the policing model when it comes to fraud, whether it be the big international frauds or the scamming type of frauds, is a broken model because it was never designed for it in the first place. What we need to do is design a completely new system for dealing with fraud. Congratulations to the City of London Police for what they do, but really the model is completely out of date. Okay, thank you, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and then any more questions, contributions for people who haven't? Uh, yeah, this gentleman right at the back, please. Hi, James Bolton Jones. I work with Stuart Spotlight on Corruption. Um, so one of the main uh, aspects of the uh, new financial services and markets bill is to uh, introduce a secondary competitive objective for the uh, FSA and for the um, PRA on um, promoting the competitiveness of the uh, UK financial system. What do panellists think of sort of reformulating that to uh, cover the competitiveness in terms of fighting economic crime? Thanks. Okay, thank you. And then any final questions or contributions from people? Uh, you wanted to come in. Just very, very quick one. Yeah. Just to, to follow up on the financial literacy and what you said, John, you're absolutely right that, that schools do implement things such as understanding of mortgages, pensions, things like that. I think the key difference is what schools believe is that if you're IT literate, you're financially savvy when it comes to scams, yeah. but there is a big, big difference because th put yourself as a 16-year-old who's never had a letter in their lives, if you get an email from the, the HMRC when you've started your first job, are you going to reply to it, click on a link? You probably are, because you're IT literate, but you're not financially literate, so you think it's important. And I think that's the key difference. Yeah, I get a lot of HMRC fake emails. Uh, no <laughs> doubt other people have that as well. Um, great. Okay, so uh, panellists, if you could answer some of those So questions. just on John's first question, uh, is it John back there, uh, about competitiveness, I mean, in effect, it already is, because if you look at the, uh, the indices that rank com com countries' GFCs in terms of international competitiveness, uh, transparency and economic crime will be one of the measures that go into the indices, so it's, it's already part of the measure of competitiveness. Great. Susan, final thoughts from you. Um, I mean, I think the really interesting point about, um, you know, what we do about fraud policing, uh, and, and I think it's not because the same skills are needed across all of these crimes, you know, corruption, fraud, money laundering, we need more financial investigators, uh, and we need some kind of um, better centralised oversight. Uh, as with Tom, we don't necessarily think a new agency it carries lots of huge risks to kind of start again and you lose lots of good expertise on the way. Uh, but we are, I think, you know, we hear this all the time that it, enforcement is is the thing that is screaming out to be addressed and we need, I, mean, I don't think the Royal Commission is such a cop out because we do need it's something incredible. that is going to, you know, try and solve this issue that is very, very thorny. Um, and, and I think it is tricky, like, you know, would you, the person in the street would rather that they someone comes and sorts out their burglary if they burgled, but sort out their fraud if they've been defrauded. You know, they're not either all things, and how do you build that into policing is important. Thank you, Tom. Um, so to, to James, I remember um, Bill Winters, the CEO of uh, Standard Chartered, had a quote on their website at one point which said that uh, he saw that fighting financial crime should be a competitive advantage for Standard Chart. Now, not sure about that because it should be a sort of team sport, but you know, maybe we should be making more about, you know, which organisations are taking this issue seriously and which aren't, and, you know, maybe the which best buy tables should reflect that and that sort of thing. But, I mean, certainly we need to find ways of engendering um, uh, enthusiasm uh, in, uh, in the private sector to, to combat uh, financial crime. Uh, to the front here, um, you know, we think about, we think about fin the financial crime issue being sort of quite a domestic thing and so on, but actually, you know, if you talk to people who are high commissioners or ambassadors around the world, they're constantly being bombarded by, by countries that they're in saying, hey, look, you know, your country is a destination for dirty money from our country. 
sometimes our response should be, your country is where a lot of the phone calls come from that try to rip off our people. So I think there is a role in all of this for the Foreign Office. And the last thing I would say, just in reflection of that, is one of the great things that was said to me by a, an, an EU diplomat uh, once was, the problem with the UK when it comes to responding to money laundering and financial crime and fraud, whatever you want to wrap it up, is the UK views this as a problem uh, for which they are responsible for 60 million people. But you guys are responsible for 10 billion people because you're a global financial centre. And until we recognise that, we will, to use the phrase again, continue to shuffle deck chairs. John. Um, so to start with the point about the duty of competition, um, I think there's, there's potentially really interesting mileage in the notion that we might choose our banks. I mean, most of us don't move banks very often anyway. But wouldn't it be interesting if banks started saying, we're a safer place to put your money because we will protect you better from scams? Now, that, that would actually get my attention. I think it would get quite a lot of people's attention. It's not something that you see in the, the marketing positioning of any high street banks at the moment. The problem with it is it only takes you about halfway there, if that, because there's an awful lot of other money laundering activity, which is B2B, not B2C. Um, and so it will help with the, the retail part of the equation, but not the, uh, not, not the, uh, the, the big international flows um, at all. Um, the other part of me says that the point about the duty of competition for the FCA is wearing my hat as somebody who wrote the government's recent report on competition policy. There's a whole heck of a lot of other stuff that the FCA needs to do to sharpen up financial services competition um, for the benefit of consumers other than fraud, um, which absolutely urgently needs to happen. Um, and I wouldn't want to, to blunt any of that. But nonetheless, wouldn't it be great if they were, you know, in the same way as some, you know, some train companies hollow laugh after, the, after yesterday's um, you know, strikes and some air car companies try to say, airlines try to say, yeah, we're more likely to be on time. Wouldn't it be great if banks started doing the same thing for, for safety too? And the point about, um, about the policing model, I mean, look, I think I've, my, my resolution as a result of this conversation here this afternoon is, I want to go back, you know, we, we stood as a party with a manifesto that said we're going to have 10,000 more police, right? We all, we all sort of knocked on doors and, and, and said we're going to recruit 10,000. Well, I want to know if where's are 4,000 of those sitting behind screens rather than walking up and down on streets? Because 4,000 of them at least should be dealing with fraud, dealing with scams, dealing with um, online and other kinds of financial crime. And if they're not, then probably we as a party and we as a society are kind of getting that wrong. I'm sure it's also right to say that the organisational model needs to be changed around. We're already doing it for things like regional organised crime units, um, which try to do that for, for regional organised crime, rather obviously. Um, so we're halfway down that road for some kinds of crime already. It seems rather obvious, I'm sure you're right, sir, um, that therefore we need to not just up the amount of, um, of resource, but also the way it's organised, because the way it's organised is not... Dixon of Dot Green, and everybody knows each other in a small community um, where, where everybody knows the face of everybody down the pub. Great, thank you, John. Um, and I think the sort of rallying call from today's event is more bobbies behind the screens, which is perhaps <laughs> not the, the sexiest uh, the Italians mantra. The Italians have 70,000 of them, remember that? <laughs> yes. They have 70,000. Yeah. But the sentiment is certainly right. So um, thank you uh, to everyone coming today. Thank you, everyone who's been watching online. Um, just to say that if you're interested in Bright Blue becoming a member, you can speak to some of my uh, team at the back and find out more about that. We're offering £10 of membership for the year uh, during the whole of the conference. Uh, and you've got in your goodie bags our whole fringe guide. We've got a record 33 events that we're doing this year. Um, so please do come along to them. The next one in here in half an hour is on air pollution. Uh, and how we tackle that. So please come and uh, join us for that. Uh, a big thank you to our partner, the UK Anti-Corruption uh, Coalition, for uh, partnering with us on this event. And if we could give a round of applause to the great speakers, that would be great. Thank you.